who Jesus really is. Is Jesus an alien? <laughs> I mean, is God the ultimate hip hop artist? He's just bling bling out in heaven, right? right? Lifestyles right. of the rich and famous. He's just showing off, right? <laughs> we could tie it into 666, but you know, maybe I'll, that's I was about to add, That was my follow up question to you. So, why is then 666 then associated with Satan? Prophecy is clear. And I believe part of this great deception involves aliens. Jewish people are disproportionately richer than most ethnic groups. What do you think? Why? Do you think AI could be the Antichrist? So who is Rabbi Jason Sobel? It started with an encounter. Raised in a Jewish home in New Jersey, <laughs> Rabbi Jason Sobel dedicated much of his life to finding truth. After years of seeking and studying, he encountered the Lord and found his true identity as a follower of Jesus, Yeshua. So he also is a notable figure in the Jewish and Christian circles, known for his efforts to bridge the gap between these two faiths. Rabbi Sobel dedicated much of his life seeking truth, which eventually led him to embrace Jesus as the Messiah. He's a published author of several books, including Mysteries of the Messiah, Breakthrough, Discovering the Kingdom, and Aligning with God's Appointed Times. Those works focus on unveiling the hidden connection in Scripture and have been widely acclaimed for their insightful and practical teachings. Also, he just recently released Signs and Secrets of the Messiah. So, Rabbi Jason Sobel, welcome to the Seven Figures Wide podcast. Hey, it's an honor to be with you. Excited about our conversation. I'm very excited about our conversation. I was just sharing with you off camera that I've learned more about money, specifically money and faith, specifically through Jewish and Mormon uh, encounters. So uh, I don't know what that is, but uh, <laughs> I found that a lot of my Catholic and Christian friends and leaders aren't so well doing with, with money and finance. So uh, let's get let's get started. I got a lot of questions that we're going to be talking about what's going on uh, with Israel, Hamas, what's going on with um, how you bridge the two faiths. Um, we got a video here I'd love for you to react to. I'm going to talk about um, uh, Candace Owens and Ben Shapiro follow out about, about her position about uh, potentially anti-Semitic remarks. Um, uh, church leaders, sadly, have been uh, um, asked to step down due to sin. And also, of course, because this is a seven-figure squad podcast, we're going to talk about money, <laughs> yes. finance. So um, before I jump into this, I want to share the IG reel that had me stumble across your work and got me hooked on your IG profile <laughs> and I reached out to you. I appreciate you being accessible and available. So it was based on Jesus and Numbers, a conversation you had with Pastor Samuel Rodriguez. Let's take a look at this. There's a deeper spiritual lesson that I think is really important because Jesus, Yeshua, connects bread and forgiveness. Yeah. He says, give us this day our daily bread. And the next verse is, Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. At the Lord's Supper, he broke the matzah, the unleavened bread, and said, this is my body, which is broken for you, which is significant because Yeshua, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. What was really crazy? Where was Jesus born? What city? Bethlehem. In Hebrew, Beit Lechem, the house of bread. House of bread. But here's a deeper thing. Hebrew is alphanumeric. That means that every letter has a numerical value. Bethlehem House of Bread has a numerical value of 490. Nativity in Hebrew equals 490. To be perfect or complete, Tamim in Hebrew equals 490. Come on. Why is that significant? Because Jesus, born in Bethlehem 490, was the perfect Tamim sacrifice 490. Peter comes to Jesus and says, how many times do I have to forgive? Seven times. And Jesus says, no, what does he say? 70 times seven. 490. Why did he pick that number? I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> because he is the bread of life, 490, born in Bethlehem, 490, 490, to bring forgiveness connected to 490. And here's the thing. Tamim, to be perfect or complete, equals 490. You can't be perfect or complete unless you extend the bread of forgiveness to other people. And withholding bread is like telling a starving person to go and die. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's the gem right there. By the way, I got to say, from that video to where you're at right now, physically, in yeah. person, you look great. Yeah, yeah. You're great. So, so how did you start connecting this whole alphanumeric with numbers and 
How did it come about? Yeah, numbers are obviously very significant in the Bible. And, you know, coming from a Jewish background, being a rabbi, you know, understanding the numerical connection between words hmm. is a huge thing yeah. uh, from, a, from a Jewish perspective of interpreting the scriptures. But I think one of the things that really drove me to it is that I firmly believe that there is not one wasted word in the Bible. Wow. If there is a detail in the Bible, you better believe that detail is there for a reason. God is very economical. He doesn't waste <laughs> anything. Okay. <laughs> and so that's really where it began, you know, going even back to the early gospels, John chapter two, where it says, Jesus does the miracle. Yeshua does the miracle of turning the water into wine on the sixth day of the week. Well, if it says sixth day of the week, why is it so important that it's the sixth day yeah. of the week? Well, yeah. man was created on the sixth day of the week. Yep. In Jewish thought, he fell on the sixth day of the week. We lost six things as a result of the fall. When Jesus comes, he comes to restore what was lost. He does the miracle with six stone pots. He dies on the cross on Good Friday, Friday, which on the biblical calendar is the sixth day of the week. He dies on the day of the week that man was created and he fell. And with the six stone pots, because he's when he dies on the cross, why does he die on a tree? Because how does sin enter the world? Man stole from a tree. Right. So God puts back on the tree for you and me. He has a crown of thorns on his head. Why? What's the curse of creation? The ground will produce thorns and thistles. He's taking the curse on his head to break it and to restore the blessing of the original creation. The rabbis say in the kingdom, we're going to drink the wine from the six days of creation. On the sixth day when Jesus does that miracle, they're getting a little taste of the of the wine of the kingdom that we're going to have at the marriage supper of the lamb. But one more thing. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Six, it, six is represented by the Hebrew letter Vav, which is the sixth Hebrew letter of the alphabet. Okay. And Vav is the most used letter okay. in the first five books of the Bible because it's the conjunction and. So anytime there's an and, it's the letter Vav representing okay. it, and it's stuck on to the beginning of the word. Well, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 has seven words in Hebrew representing the seven days of creation. The sixth word of the seven words of Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, begins with the sixth letter, and it's God created the heavens and is the sixth word, earth. So six represents the number of connection and the connection between heaven and earth. When wow. man disobeyed in the beginning, we broke the connection. Jesus dies on the cross to restore the connection and to restore the fruitfulness and abundance. I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly, <laughs> hence the six stone pots. So Holy we could tie it in, we could tie it into six six six, but I'll, you know, maybe I'll, that's I'll, you I was know. About to add, that was my follow-up <laughs> question to you. So why is then six 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 then associated with Satan? Or so, say time, how right, you, how right, right, right. So there's 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 two interesting things here. One is, anytime you say something three times in Hebrew, it means the maximum. So in Isaiah six, the angels cry out, "Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh, Holy, Holy, Holy." Why three times? Because when you say it three times, I mean He is the most wow. holy that you could possibly imagine. So six, six, six is the ultimate six, but there's always a positive and a negative to a number. So as we said, six is the number of physicality. The physical world was created in six days. Existence, uh, height, depth, breadth, and width has two on each side equaling six. Other uh, six directions, north, south, east, and west, up and down. So six represents the physical world. Six, six, six is complete physicality disconnected from spirituality. Wow. Hence, it's the mark of the beast, beast because you're nothing more than an animal if all you do is pursue your physical desires, appetites, and wants. You become nothing more than an animal. What's also interesting, wow. it's gross materialism. Um, what's interesting is that the only time that I'm aware that the number 666 occurs in the Bible is Solomon receives 666 talents of gold a year. That's correct. Right? And what and but the Bible tells us his heart turned astray because he put more value on the money mm. and upon his possession and upon uh, the other things that he on the physical opportunities that he had than he did on God until the end of his life when he turned back. So it represents going after gold 
instead of God, instead of going after first God in the kingdom and enjoying the gold that God gives us. Now, here's something really cool. <laughs> Think about it for a moment. Why are the streets of heaven paved with gold? Listen, I, I started out as a hip-hop DJ. All I, know is a, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. All I know is a Marine, we just guard him. <laughs> right? I mean, is God the ultimate hip-hop artist? He's just bling, bling out in heaven, right? right? Lifestyles right. of the rich right. and famous. He's just showing off, right? <laughs> Actually, it's the opposite. What people are willing to rob, kill, and destroy for in this world is nothing but pavement in heaven. Oh. It's a reversal of the values of this world. It's walking on the values of this world because God's kingdom is a kingdom of opposites. Whoa. To become more, you have to become less. Wow. To get more, you have to give more. To be the greatest, you have to be the humblest. You have to become the servant of all. So the kingdom has a different perspective than a, than a, uh, a materialistic mindset. And one more thing about 666. What is... What is six, if you turn it upside down, nine. Num, right? Nine is the number of truth in the Bible. So he turns it upside down. He turns truth on its head. Ah. <laughs> mic drop after mic drop. <laughs> right, Chris? After mic drop. Oh, so, okay. So let me, I, I was thinking about going to a different area here. So I want to talk about then what's going on in Israel uh, and Hamas. So yeah. um, some would say that... Uh, America here is starting to pull back uh, uh, Netanyahu a couple of days ago, say, hey, hey uh, United States, uh, President Biden, where, where's my military supplies? Are you guys uh, not coming through with what you said you come through? And um, and White House is like, well, we don't know what you're talking about. But there is going, uh, this bombing of Rafa, now Hezbollah a couple of days ago, or yesterday, was thinking about going into war also with with Israel so from, from, uh, from Lebanon. There's so much tension was going on, another war there uh, with Iran Israel. But it's also 12, Genesis 12, 3. God will bless those who will bless Israel and curse those who will curse Israel. So as a believer, as a faith-centered in, individual and as a community, what's the right perspective of this? Because we'll talk about Candace Owens here in a little bit. But what I don't like is that both sides, there's babies being killed, there's innocent being killed, there's civilians being killed. A lot of people don't like the way Israel's going about doing war, but then again, Hamas is hiding in human shields in, in civilian areas. So how should we be going about the proper perspective? Yeah, I mean, first of all, we acknowledge that there is terrible tragedy and loss, yes. yep. that God loves the Palestinians, God wants to see blessings upon the Palestinians. Any innocent life that is lost is an absolute tragedy. It doesn't yes. matter if it's Arab, Palestinian, Jewish, Muslim, it doesn't make a difference. Right. And, you know, God's heart. And I think we have a responsibility to pray for both and seek the peace for both. You know, with that being said, I think what we have to understand is that there's something deeper that is going on here. I think the deeper thing, I think there's two things. One is I think, unfortunately, the movement to create an independent Palestinian state has been hijacked by radical Islam. I want to be clear, radical Islam, mm -hmm. not making a comment on Islam, I'm making mm -hmm. a comment on radical Islam that wants to see the destruction of Israel and of the Jewish people and does not have a desire to live at peace and is willing to sacrifice its own people. That would be Hamas. That would be Hamas. Yep. And, what's, and what's even more so is what is the spirit behind this mm. radical group, Hamas, and these other groups in the region. And I think it's no coincidence that Hamas is actually a Hebrew word that occurs in the Bible. The wow. first time in wow. Genesis chapter 6, this is what it says, verse 11, now the earth was ruined before God and the earth was filled with violence. Wow. The word for violence there is the word Hamas in Hebrew. Really? The word for violence in Hebrew means wow. is Hamas. And God saw the earth and behold, it was ruined because all flesh had corrupted their ways upon the earth. And then it says it again in the next verse. Then, the, then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh is coming before me, for the earth is filled with Hamas. So here's the point. The spirit of Hamas is the spirit of violence. Hmm. And what's interesting is that this, why is this so spiritually significant? Listen, I don't believe in coincidences. God is in control. Mm -hmm. Things happen for a reason. This is what Yeshua Jesus says, Matthew 24, as it was in the days of Moses, 
so will it as it I'm sorry, as it or was in the Noah. days of Noah, Noah so yeah. will it be in the days of the Son of Man. Wow. Well, what what was it in the days of Noah? It was Hamas. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because this this context here is of Noah. And Genesis 6 is about Noah. It's about God telling Noah a flood is going to come, come because there is a moss, there is violence in the earth. Wow. At the end of the age, Jesus says the same spirit that permeated the earth in the very beginning that brought the flood and destruction on humanity, that grieved God's heart, that he made humanity, that spirit yeah. is going to arise again in the world yeah. before it's coming. So I don't think it's any coincidence that this organization is named Hamas. <laughs> let me ask you this question. Okay, we're in we're in Genesis six right yeah. now. So God caused a flood. Mm -hmm. Everybody dies. Yep. The animals die. Everything dies. The only thing that's on Earth is in that ark. Right. Okay. So now humanity has to be recreated again. Mm -hmm. So in other words, Hamas isn't necessarily a certain people. It's a spirit that came into people back, even though he wiped out exactly. Humanity. Hamas isn't it? We. Yes, when he says the days of Noah, he wasn't talking about this organization. He's talking about the spirit, spirit. Wow. which is behind the organization, yeah. which is a, 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 a evil, spiritually demonic spirit that has no value for life, where God says man is made in the image of God and therefore all life. It doesn't matter what you believe wow. or what race or nationality you are. Every life has value because we're made in God's image. To hurt an individual isn't just to hurt an individual, it's to attack God himself in whose image every single individual is made. That's why racism, discrimination of any sort is an yeah. absolute abomination to God because every person is made in his image. To have hate towards an individual is to have hate towards God. Yeah. Trying to hurt an individual is to do harm towards God. Yeah. yeah. You know, Rabbi, one of the things that I experienced in the Marine Corps is uh, not only the experience extreme violence, but I also also saw the unification of humanity. Well, for example, in, in the Marines, I remember this kid from uh, McCoy. I remember the kid from the just the deep south. Yeah. And I'm from Chicago, and there's a brother from Dallas, big big brother, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Johnson. And uh, he, the kid looks at us. He said, this is the first time in my entire life I s I've seen somebody that's not white. Hmm. Okay, so we're like, check that out. What's, what's going on here? Anyway, we go through training, sweat, Tears, we get deployed, blood, sweat, tears. And guess what happened? That guy became a brother. Wow. He didn't look at us anymore black, brown. He looked at us as green, like Marine Corps green. Yeah. So the, the byproduct, the, you know, the, with the bad also comes the good. I think that's what I learned the most from the Marines is that I started, I can't say that, I, that Jesus did that to me. Pressure yeah. and war did that to me. Yeah. And so, but some, speaking of war, some would say that how much further should the U.S. continue to support Israel and while our own people here in America are suffering, our veterans are suffering, homelessness is suffering, and, and the way that Israel conducting this military operation is causing too much civilian casualties. But but how, how should we how would you answer that? Yeah, I think there's I think there's two things. I think one, Israel has minimized the first of all, the numbers of casualties are inflated by Hamas. They're the ones giving the numbers, okay? They're not accurate numbers. Even the UN had a pullback, mm -hmm. UNRWA had a pullback saying, no, they're not accurate. Um, so, the, but again, any life that is lost is horrible. But the yes. question is, what do you do when you have an organization that says, we will do this again and again and again to you yep. if we have an opportunity who uses hospitals, who uses mosques, who uses schools, who uses the people as human shields uh -huh. for this purpose. Uh -huh. What I would say is, yes, that is horrible. But what I'd say is that the Palestinian people will never be free if Hamas is the organization that is ruling over them because yeah. they murder anyone who does not agree with them or go along with their program. And they've taken billions of dollars and instead of building schools and infrastructures and in making uh, Gaza, a beautiful place. Yeah. They've stored up weapons and built tunnels and yeah. they take the aid that comes in. So even for the sake of the Palestinians, they, they need to be liberated from this evil, in, in my opinion. But I, but, but I, but I think there's something else. I think, this, I think this something else is this, is that I think we have to remember that this attack against Israel is not just an attack against Israel. So that's a mistake a lot of people make. 
this attack is actually an attack twofold. One, it's attack against the West. Mm. It's attack against America. Because what's happening is Hamas is funded by Iran. Iran is in relationship with Russia and with China. And basically, all those nations, what they have in common and why they're united is that they are united against the United States because they no longer want us to be the world's superpower, Power. either militarily or economically. Economic. And so they are looking to undermine our authority and our place in the world. They can't directly come against us here, but they're beginning there. And they're trying to distract the world from all the other things that are wow. going on. And this is and it's attack against God. It's attack against Judeo-Christian values and Judeo-Christian faith as well. Because because Hamas wants to prove that God's a liar. God's a liar, yep. and they're mocking America. America can't defend their allies. Yep. And they're not going to come to their aid. And what they're doing on the college campuses to, I mean, look. Here's the crazy thing on the college campuses. It's one thing to be concerned about the Palestinians' rights. It's another thing to say we support Hamas, who are murderers and rapists. Yes. And 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 then and then say we and then so many of these go to we want to kill the Jews in general. Exactly. I, this I, is not this is not something that is peaceful. And this is a way Iran and these organizations are infiltrating America yep. to ultimately turn on turn people turn us on ourselves. Ultimately. How much time have you spent in Israel? A lot. Yeah. But, yeah, it's interesting to me that a majority of this uh, college movement, the Free Palestine movement, when it comes from these colleges and making a lot of the Jewish students very uh, uncomfortable and, and and bullied, but none of them have ever been to Israel, let alone Palestine. Well, here's the crazy thing: in Israel, there are over two and a half million Palestinians that they they, they you know they have full freedom. They vote. Um, they serve in the Israeli government. They serve on the Supreme Court. Um, no, are things perfect? No. In Israel. In Israel. In Israel. Holy moly. Yeah. It, there's 2.5 there million Arab citizens of Israel that have complete rights in Israel. So when people say Israel is an apartheid state, is an absolute lie because an apartheid state is that, that there was a minority group right. that has their rights uh, squashed, that they yeah. don't have rights. In South Africa, the, uh, South, the uh, Africans... Uh, South Africans could not vote, yeah. right? It was the white South Africans that had it. This is not the case in Israel. Uh, Muslims, Palestinians, all can vote. They're represented in the government. They're represented on all levels of Israeli society. It's just not true. What's clear is that when you see, and what's disturbing, is when you see these students yelling, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. From the river is the Jordan River, the sea is the Mediterranean. You're basically saying we're wiping Israel off the map. Because right in between. Because right. that's, that's <laughs> where Israel exists. Yeah. So, I mean, this is the thing. Israel has always been for coexistence. They have, you know, Gaza has been under complete Palestinian control for, you know, 15 or so years. Mm -hmm. The West Bank, most of it, it, so much of it is under Palestinian control. They're not under military occupation by Israel. They're not allowed to create a standing military, but wow. otherwise they have freedom to govern and to do whatever they want to do to, de yep. to de develop whatever society they want to develop. And so it's concerning to me that this is the direction that so many of our college students are taking, not one of how do we find mutual coexistence, how do we find a solution to peace, but in, what it seems is the solution to peace is the destruction to Israel. They, right. they don't want peace. They want every piece of the land of Israel. That's, right. That's what they want. That's right. And Candace Owens uh, shared some similar views, even though she may not have agreed. But Ben Shapiro, very, very devout, very supportive of, of, of Israel. But he's not a Messianic Jew. No, he, he's no, it's a traditional Orthodox Jew. Traditional Orthodox, right. Uh, and they fired her from her job uh, from the Daily Wire. So I, I, have you been? Have been yeah, I'm familiar yeah. with a little bit of it. Yeah. So, so what, what's your take on what's going on there in terms of Ben Shapiro and uh, Candace Owens, a former? And now she now she says, "I'm free. I'm free." <laughs> Listen, I, I think my concern with what I see with what Candace Owens is saying, I do think she borders on. She's for clearly anti-Israel, in my opinion. I'm not ready to say she's anti-Semitic, but I think she's certainly not a friend of Israel or supportive of Israel. I think 
part of my concern with that that kind of stream of movement. And, and I'm friends with some of the guys that that, that she that she knows. Um, but the thing is, that I think it's a danger when America, the America first understanding becomes America only. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have to make America, we have to take care of our home. We sure. have to take care of our nation. We have to take care of the poor and the needy in our nation. But at the same time, America is the force in the world that is restraining evil and so much of, of the negative things that are happening. And because America is weak right now, that is why we're seeing yeah. all this of people. And make no mistake, China and Russia and Iran are making friends and have stepped into the vacuum that we have left. It's not... It's not in our interest not to have friends in the world because this is a global world we live in. Everything is connected. There are economic and political ramifications sure. if we abdicate our historic role in the world. So should that dovetail into how we should process the way we vote in Absolutely. November? Absolutely. Because Absolutely. If, you, if you're looking at these things, if I, if, I, if I take personalities out and look at leader versus leader, you said America is weak right now. The way I look at any organization is how strong is the leader. Absolutely. And so uh, you may not like the person, but you got to look, my opinion, but you got to look into the policies that's helping America or helping us at our home. Listen, no matter what side of the aisle you sit on, we have a president who is cognitively very clear, not fully there. <laughs> okay. It's very easy to see that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that the most powerful man in the free world how much is he really running the show? There is a real question there. I would say <laughs> more than a question. For sure. That is a major concern. And the world sees that. They understand it. And that is just one of many things. Besides yeah. the policy, the yeah. leader himself yep. looks frail and impaired. And that is a dangerous place for our nation to be. Yeah. And he's in, he's in France for the D-Day. The, 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 the he's in the G7 summit, you know, wandering off. Um, do you think there's going to be a surprise candidate on the Democratic side, like a like a Hillary Clinton or a Michelle Obama, Michelle Obama, <laughs> or I, Gavin Newsom? I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a possibility. Yeah. I think it really. I think they're. I think they're going to wait and see what the numbers look like closer to the Democratic National Convention to see what happens. And I think they'll make the decision there. Or I think if he does run, I think he would pull out pretty quick if he got, yeah. got elected. Well, I, I believe that there, we have a, a, a debate coming up here. And it's not going to look good for him to debate Trump. Trump's got all, all sorts of motivation right now to, to take him down. And he can, he can still rip. Um, I want to talk to you about your, your encounter with Jesus, because many of your Jewish brothers and sisters would not agree with you. Right. Um, and I found this clip here, uh, Jews and Jesus don't mix. So can we take a look at this clip and what this interaction between two Jewish brothers? Mm -hmm. It's a Christian YouTube channel where we promote Jewish faith in Jesus. Well, you know, I'm very much so against that. Yeah, how come? Yeah. Because as a people, we're against idolatry. Yes. And uh, believing in Christianity and yeah. trying to get Jews to Christianity yes. is sort of spiritually destroying us. How so? And because you think he's God, of course, that's your, your opinion. He thinks he's the Messiah. Yeah, yeah. And I don't see it as that. The yeah. Jewish people don't see it as that. So some bring a us lot do actually. some very small percentage. Yeah, yeah. And of course, there's Jews who are against Israel as well. You know, the, right. the fact that there's Jews that believe in that doesn't make it right or wrong. Right. But the majority of us throughout history right. have rejected to be converted to Christianity or to Islam. And I think that the Jews for Jesus movement is trying to make Christianity kosher for Jews mm. and sucking them out of where they're from mm. and bring them to Christianity. Even though Jews for Jesus believes that that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. So it's, it's, well, it's a natural it's really progression. Messiah, see, like saying stuff like that is kind of like tricking to make Jews see like, oh, it's our Messiah. But it's actually the Messiah for the world that you're projecting. And you're telling Jews to feel like, oh, he's mine too. Yeah, but Jews are part of the world. For sure. But yes. you, you like specifically choose language to make Jews feel comfortable with a message that is very foreign to us and very destructive to us. Okay, what do you mean by us? What is over there? What's, what's your response? Yeah, what's your I reaction mean, I, to listen, that? Listen, I, I would totally disagree with the jet with the jewish gentleman who does not believe look here's the reality the hebrew bible gives all these prophecies about the messiah where he was going to be born bethlehem 
there's no Jews in Bethlehem today. Messiah couldn't even be born there, right? It's under total Palestinian control. There's not one Jew living in Bethlehem wow. today, right? Um, we know it says a virgin will conceive and bear a son. It talks about Isaiah 53. He was bruised for our transgressions, crushed for iniquities by his stripes, uh, were healed. So there's all these messianic prophecies, even prophecies that Israel would reject the Messiah, that the majority of Israel would reject the Messiah, Isaiah 53, Zechariah 12, 10. They will look upon the one whom they have pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for an only begotten son. This will happen when Messiah returns. So look, I believe there's only one person in history that has fulfilled the job description of the Messiah. <laughs> That's number one. It was Yeshua. It was Jesus. And we could get more into that. But number two, what I'd say is that here's the problem. All the first followers of Jesus were Jewish. They were a Jewish movement. Yeah. They, they were in Jerusalem for the Jewish holiday of Pentecost in Hebrew Shavuot, the day the Torah was given. They celebrated Passover. The Last Supper was the Passover. Every major event in Jesus' life happened on a Jewish holiday. <laughs> and, and so it was a sect of Judaism of which there were many in the first century. There was no question in the very beginning whether you were Jewish if you believed in him as the Messiah. Different sects believed in many different messiahs. The problem is over time, as the message went out to the Gentiles and the majority of people who believe came to be Gentiles, and then what happened is the Gentiles, uh, there were some Gentiles who decided they, they wanted to strip the Jewishness away from the gospel to appeal to their cultures. That's when we have it no longer being recognized as being Jewish. And so wow. what I'd say is it's kind of like Joseph. When his brothers went down to Egypt, they didn't recognize him. They looked, sure. He walked like an Egyptian. He right. talked like an Egyptian. It was only the second time when he took off his garments and says, I'm a neo Seph, I'm Joseph, but they recognized him. We've made Jesus an Egyptian. We've made him unrecognizably Jewish. Listen, when I was growing up in New Jersey, I thought Jesus was a nice Jewish boy who converted and became Roman Catholic because I didn't know any <laughs> Jewish kids by the name of Jesus who had mothers by the name of Mary. And just like I'm Jason Sobel, yeah. I thought they were the Christ family. Mr. and Mrs. Christ, Mr. and Mrs. So, Mrs. So, I thought wow. Christ was his last name. I didn't know that Christ was the Greek for the Hebrew, which was the Messiah, the anointed one. Wow. And so the Jewishness of Jesus, his original context has been lost. And so that's part of what we're passionate about, right. helping to restore that. That is the fusion between old and new, because then I believe it's not to be deceptive. It's to restore Jesus to who he actually was and to how he actually lived in worship and help Christians to be able to understand that. Wow, that's amazing. Um, I, I also want to, now that you mentioned that, because um, other folks are also creating a narrative about who Jesus really is. Is Jesus an alien? <laughs> Let's take a look at this clip from the PBD podcast with Billy Carson here and who he thinks Jesus is. Just to you. In your eyes, who is Jesus? His name is Yeshua. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jesus is, uh, first, the J is a, is a recent letter. The J is not that old. So it really was originally Isus. And that name, Isus, means Hail Zeus. Okay. So you're calling on Zeus when you say Jesus. Now, one of the Sumerian people who converted over to the Greek gods. But when you, his name is Yeshua, and so Yeshua to me, very powerful person, uh, very spiritual, high level of knowledge, mm -hmm. um, uh, a, a student of the Egyptian mysteries. When Jesus disappears from the Bible, he actually ends up in Egypt, okay? You can find this information in a book that was kept out of the biblical text called the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. And in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, he shows up in Egypt, and we know that's a fact because I take people on tour every year to Egypt, and I take them to the house that Jesus lived in. It's a crypt. It's actually worship. People come there to see that bed that he laid in every single year. When I take people there, we take them straight there. Uh, so, and we know the path that he traveled throughout Egypt because it's a, a huge sign outside that Coptic church where he lived that shows where he went. Now, when he was in Egypt, what did he go there for? To learn the Egyptian mysteries. Who taught the Egyptian mysteries? Thoth, the Atlantean priest king, the person I wrote, wrote this book about. Uh, and so Thoth was the teacher of the Egyptian mysteries or the ancient mysteries of what, what it was called. Okay. And then he leaves. You sat there. Okay. How much of that could you take? <laughs> uh, wow. <laughs> so I, I, you know, when I, first of all, there's a few things. One is I know he's popular, mm -hmm. but again, I think he's misrepresenting things. 
on the one hand, he says his name is Yeshua, and then he goes into Isus. Isus. The problem is that is a name that's ultimately given to him from trying to take the Hebrew and put into a Greek. It's not what he was called, right? It's not what his family knew him by. It's not mm. what his disciples called him. So that's anachronistic to say they were worshiping Zeus because no one would have under that. Like, again, that's like me saying Christ and Messiah, right? Mm. I mean, so mm. again, totally wrong. His name was Yeshua. It's a form, it's a shortened form of Yehoshua, Joshua in second temple Judaism coming from the Aramaic, which means God is my salvation. God saves. Hmm. So it's, he's, it's totally a Hebrew name. Yes. Jesus was in Egypt. Yeshua was in Egypt as a child, right? We know his family went down to Egypt. It says, uh, he fulfilled prophecy in Hosea out of Egypt. I called my son. Why did he have to go to Egypt? Very simple because the Bible is very clear. Prophecy is clear. It says in Deuteronomy 18, I will raise up a prophet like Moses from your midst. So all of Judaism says the Messiah is going to be a greater than Moses. Hmm. Where did Moses come out of? Egypt. So therefore, sure Jesus did. had to spend a time in Egypt because he's following the type and the model of Moses. Why did he multiply why did Yeshua multiply the loaves and the fish? Because Moses gave manna. Yeshua multiplies the bread and the fish. Moses parts the water. What does Yeshua do? He walks on the water. What's the first sign that Moses does to redeem the children of Israel? He turns the water Boy, into blood. What's yeah. the first miracle Moses uh, Yeshua does? He turns the water into wine. He's the greater than Moses, not to bring death, to bring life, that we might have it more abundantly. He's trying. The, the New Testament is showing him as the greater than Moses. That's the context wow. of what's going on. But there's, some, but there's something more here. This idea that Jesus was an alien. Listen, I get it. <laughs> I get it. Listen, part of my spiritual journey is I grew up in a Jewish family, I, I, but I wanted a connection with God. I got mm. into martial arts. I got into Eastern philosophy and meditation. I thought Jesus was an avatar, some sort of God, man. Mm. I had new age teachers telling me when Jesus said, go into the, you know, go into your room and close the door. Go, that's, that's meditation. Yeah. I mean, there's all sorts of people claiming Jesus for their own religious purposes and plans, but that's not who he says he is or mm. what the New Testament says about him, which is very clear. But I think there's something really important. I think this is an example of the times that we're living in. Mm. Because again, Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about the end times. He talks about a great falling away that will deceive the elect. And I believe part of this great deception involves aliens. And one of the reasons why I say that is because you have, like, I think media prepares people for beliefs and shapes their beliefs. It's very, media is very prophetic, sure. right? I remember growing up thinking like Dick Tracy, the, the, the watches you could call people on your watch, and now we can call people on our watch, right? right? Yeah, right. So these things that we see in TV and movies eventually become reality yeah. for the most part. One of the most popular shows on History Channel is Ancient Aliens. For sure. right? And they try and show how you know things in the Bible are really aliens, and he's yeah. one of the people on the show. But here's the point. If there's going to be a false messiah and antichrist, and he's going to lead people astray into a false religion, how do you discredit all the world's religions simultaneously? One way to do it is to say they're all aliens that came down and gave this technology. There's alien references in the Bible, and therefore Christianity, Judaism, Islam. Hier hieroglyphics in Egypt. Hier yeah, yeah, yeah. It, all of it's not true. Yeah, yeah. All of it is from this... Uh, this the ancient astronauts, these alien civilizations, and I believe that possibly could be part of the great deception that's coming. Do you think AI could be the Antichrist? I, I think I think AI can definitely is definitely a part of how the Antichrist operates because here's the thing. The thing about the anti the thing about Satan in general is Satan is not a creator. He doesn't have a creative bone in his body. He is an imitator. He imitates and counterfeits everything and God confuses. is. Right? And he confuses. Yeah. Well, yeah. think about it. Why does, he, why, does he prowl, why does he prowl around like a roaring lion? Because Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Why does he masquerade as an angel of light? Because Jesus is the light of the yeah, world. That's right. Why is there contention for the Temple Mount in Jerusalem? Because that's 
the place God says he's going to place his name forever. And the enemy says, that's where I want, if that's where God's going to be worshiped, no, I'm going to be worshiped in the place that yeah. the Lord says he's going to be worshiped. So why do I say, why do I say all of that? I say all of that to say this is that that is part of this great deception that is coming because again, the enemy is going to imitate God. One of the things that God is, is he is omniscient. He knows all things. The enemy can't know all things because he's not omniscient. He is not God. AI is a false type of omniscience <laughs> that can make it seem <laughs> like he is all-knowing right. because if everything, everyone is connected to the internet yeah. and everyone is wired, yeah. then he can hear your thoughts, your conversations. Yeah. Yeah. You know, He knows yeah. what you're reading, what you're doing, and there's a lot of predictive analytics that can be done to manipulate you or make it appear the things that are known about you supernaturally when it's really just using advanced technology. Right. And all advanced technology seems like it's magic or supernatural to less advanced cultures. <laughs> right? That's right. That's correct. Um, it's, uh, I want to talk about uh, conduct uh, with inside the church, uh, the Christian church. You know, over the years, you know, we got Bill Hybels of Willow Creek Community Church, Corey Turner of the New Emma Church, Brian Houston of Hillsong Church, Carl Lentz of Hillsong Church, uh, Rabbi uh, Zacharias, uh, although not a pastor, but he founded yeah. International Ministries. Dr. Tony Evans just recently stepped down uh, three weeks ago. Robert Morris, uh, a faith advisor to the Trump White House, resigned from Gateway Church after he was accused of abusing a child in the 1980s just two days ago. So what is... What, what, what is going on? With, what, so what is going on in the church in terms of church leaders? Because as I read many of my heroes in the Bible, they've all been taken down because of sexual sin. So what is really the proper conduct of, of, a, of a leader of a church? First of all, I think, again, I think one of the great pictures of the end that we really need to understand is the story of Joseph. Literally, in the story of Joseph, seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. The seven years of famine is like the seven years in the book of Revelation, that there's going to be this time of trials and tribulations in the world. The Jewish brothers don't recognize Joseph the first time. They only recognize him the second time. Okay, so Joseph is a paradigm for the end, in a sense, of what is going to happen. But there's two interesting things about Joseph in relationship to this question. In Jewish thought, he's known as Yosef Atzadik, Joseph, the, the, the righteous one, because when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him, he literally ran away from her. And she grabbed his cloak. Right, grabbed his cloak, <laughs> and he wound up in prison, even though he had done the right thing and not the wrong thing. But here's the point. We're always going to have Potiphar's wives. Wow. There's always going to be someone or something that's going to try and get us to be able to compromise. And if you compromise, you kill your calling. In the same way, if you tr the surest way to destroy your dream is to try and live somebody else's. So them stepping down, is that compromise? Well, what I'm saying, I think them doing the sexual misconduct yeah. is the compromise they gave in Got it. To, to the degree that it's true and sure. i you know i don't know any of the particular to the degree that one gives in you're giving in to potiphar's wife you're giving in to that compromise so you allowed yourself to be in that scenario to You've be allowed to yourself be compromised. to be in that scenario or you chose to give in to your fleshly lusts or desires which is which is very easy to do. But I, I think one of the things that we have to understand as a practical principle is that I think one of the most dangerous things for a leader is to, is to be unbroken. There's nothing more dangerous than a leader who doesn't walk with a limp. <laughs> Right. Jacob had to wrestle with God and literally be broken by God in order to go from it, go from Jacob, which means supplanter or deceiver mm -hmm. to becoming Israel. One who is upright or one who wrestles with God is overcome. There has to be a degree of brokenness in our life that leads to humility and empathy. Listen, I had this dream that was from God. I was I live in Los Angeles. We do ministry some in Hollywood. I was at a Hollywood premiere in this dream. I'm walking down the red carpet, and all of a sudden, the, red, the, the floodlights for the premieres are being sh shown in my face. And I'm like, oh, it hurts. Please take them off me. I couldn't see. They blinded me. The lights come off me, and I hear God speak to me. He says, if you ever try and take my light, 
and put it on yourself. If you ever try and take my glory and make it your own, you will become blinded. As long as you remain small in your own sight, you'll remain significant for in me his sight. in his sight. Wow. Smallness is the way to greatness. The problem is oftentimes we're not meant to handle the degree of success in the pedestal people put us on. And when, we're, when we have fame or wealth and fortune, what it does, those things are a magnifier. They magnify the good in us and they magnify the bad in us. And if we're not broken and if we don't have that support system around us and we don't deal with those things, it ultimately leads to downfall. Wow. My last question here before we wrap up, I got to talk about money. All right. Um, faith and finance. Uh, uh, Rabbi Lapin, who wrote the forward to my book, he said that the Jewish people are disproportionately richer than most ethnic groups. In your opinion, I want to know, what do you think? Why? Yeah, I think, I, think there's a, I think there's a number of reasons. I think, number one, it has to do with a mindset. And I think that mindset is one of understanding you know, what is a biblical perspective on faith? And, and see, I think that Christians have this idea that being poor is spiritual. And, you know, and I think there's an over-spiritualization in the church sometimes of a sign of spirituality where Jewish people understand that wealth is a blessing from God. Amen. And they have the faith to believe for it yep. and to trust God for it. But I think there is something else. I think part of it has to do with community and family. See, identity is destiny. Every Friday night we celebrate Shabbat dinner and the parents bless their children. The husbands bless their wives. Give me an example. Give me an example of that. All right. Tell so me. we're sitting around. How do you bless your children? Yes. Yeah, so, you so, so we're sitting around the table and there's a traditional prayer for the boys, may God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. For the girls, may God make you like Sarah, Rachel, Rebecca, and Leah. And then there's the ironic benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you. May he give you shalom. And then I speak personal blessings over my kids. Hey, this is what I see in you. This is what God has called you to be. This is who God has created you to be, right? And so my kids have an entrepreneurial spirit and a boldness because that has been spoken mm. over their life. It's been inculcated in them. They know they have a family that believes in them. They have, a, you know, like, again, my son is 17. He's starting a clothing brand. Yes. And, you know, he's out there going be a for customer. it. So right? Right. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Be, because why? Be, because we've always been there to encourage him and support him and told him, listen, you have the ability to do it and the responsibility to do it. And have tried to inculcate that mindset in them. So I think there is that sense of Jewish understanding that we have a responsibility more than anything else to invest in the next generation. Cool. That is our primary commitment is to invest in the next generation. From generation to generation has been one of the cries of the Jewish community. And so I think that there are other ethnic groups that share that value as well. But I think in America, if we understood that there is no greater importance than to be a father or a mother, to invest in our children, to pursue the success of our children, and then not just give them the um, financial tools, which is important, but to give them, to create in them an identity and a mindset that is entrepreneurial from the time they are young, yeah. then yeah. it gives them the ability to think that it's actually it's actually possible. One of the greatest destroyers of wealth is divorce. I've been through it. Yeah. And, and I've seen many of yeah. our clients go through it. How is divorce looked upon in the Jewish community? Look, divorce is obviously... Is it higher? Is it lower? Um, divorce rate is historically lower in, in the, the Jewish, Jewish community. community and historically lower in the more religious Jewish community. But divorce has never been the stigma in the Jewish community that it has been in the wider Christian community. I mean, it's less so today, but historically it's been. Wow. Well, I wish I had more time to spend with you, but uh, I'd love to have you back. Absolutely. I, I We'd mean, love to uh, come back. I'd love to talk about more about uh, these topics as, as things develop. And now that you're kind of back and forth to Dallas, yeah. uh, I think uh, you're more ready available. So I, listen, if you want to find more about Rabbi 
uh, Jason, Jason Sobel, hit S-O-B-E-L. Uh, make sure you purchase his book here today. We'll put all the links here in the description below. Um, also, there's other books here that you guys need to pick up. Uh, there was a Ford here by Kathleen Gifford, really. No, we wrote that book together. No, wrote it's, it's, a, it's the most popular book on Israel. About a million copies sold of that wow. book. Wow. And uh, yeah, The Rock, The, the Road, and, and The Rabbi. rabbi. It's yep. amazing. And of course, Mysteries of the Messiah. Go pick it up. Yep. That being said, I appreciate you tuning in. Uh, what are your biggest takeaways? Uh, you agree with us? You don't agree with us? We want to know. Please put it in the comment section below. Make sure you subscribe to the Seven Fear Squad YouTube channel. Like, share, and make sure you follow Rabbi Jason Sobel. Till meet again. Continue to live smart. Continue to love smart. And be mind smart today. God bless you guys. Bye bye. <laughs>